is what a gay priest look like. I am black, I'm African, I'm Nigerian, I'm also British, I'm gay, and I'm living with HIV. So I am extremely, I'm so happy. You know, there is nothing stopping me with my relationship with God and with Jesus. I love God with all my heart and I love Jesus with all my soul. So yes, it is okay and it is possible to be both gay and to be a priest and to be a Christian. How do I back it biblically? The Bible says that for God so loved the world that God gave his only son that whosoever loved him, you know, or believe in him shall, in, in, shall not perish but have eternal life. That is my backing. The other one is also Psalm 139 that says that for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 to 5 also says that for God knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. So God knew who I am as a gay man. You know, I often say that, you know, the Lord is my shepherd and he knows that I'm gay. So there's no question about my sexuality. So I, it's not controversial for me. It might be controversial for you. So let's dissect this claim. Can you be a Christian and be gay? Well, we got to understand this one thing. What is the definition of a Christian? There's three things that you got to understand. Christian comes from the Greek word Christianos. Christ means anointed, and the other half of the word, tien, means little one. So being a Christian literally means little anointed one. You know, when Jesus was around, people recognized who he was. They saw the miracle signs and wonders. They knew that he was a Messiah that fulfilled all of the prophecies. They knew that he was a resurrected Savior. And Christians were the was a title given to his followers. Why? Because they followed suit of who he was. As a Christian, there is supposed to be a marker. So there's three main components of what it truly means to be a Christian. You have your Bibles? Let's go to Romans chapter 5, and let's go through this together. Romans chapter 5 says, it says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because what Jesus our Lord has done for us, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. The first thing that you need to understand when it comes to being a Christian and what it means to be a true Christian is that you need to put your faith in Christ. Not faith in your own ability, not faith in a denomination, not faith in religion. Your faith needs to be put in Christ. Because what you need to understand is that your works is not going to save you. Once you die, there's nobody that can pay you out of money or pray you out of where you are to get you into heaven. Salvation is done on the merit of what Jesus did on the cross for us. So you must have faith in God. That's number one. And it's more than just faith in him. Because step number two is that you actually need to believe. The Bible says this in James chapter 2, verse 19. Watch this with me. James 2, 19, it says, You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe, and they tremble in terror. So it's not ju enough just to have faith in God. You must believe. And how do we believe? Romans chapter 10 has the answer in that. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to Romans chapter 10. This is what it says. Start from verse 5. Romans chapter 10, verse 5. Romans 10 chapter 5 says, For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. But faith's way of getting right with God says, Don't say in your heart, Who will go up to the heaven and bring Christ down to earth? And don't say, Who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again? Uh, to life again? In fact, it says, The message is very close at hand. It's on your lips and is written in your heart. And this is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For it is by believing that in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As scripture tells us, anyone who trusts on the name of the Lord shall never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
So it's not just about believing, uh, not just about having faith in him. You must believe and confess with your mouth that he is the Lord and Savior of your life. Those are two indicators that you are a Christian. And the third one is this. It's not just to have faith in him. It's not just to believe in him. You must obey his commandments. And I say this is the most important part and the one thing that you need to understand. You must obey what he has spoken and said down in scripture. Is this kind of a lifestyle? Is it pleasing unto God? This is the last thing that Jesus said to the apostles before he descended and before he sent the Holy Spirit. Go with me to Matthew chapter 28. In verse 18, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. The marker of the Christian is that you have faith in Jesus, you believe that he's the Lord and Savior of your life, and that you obey all of his commands. And this is something that he's reiterated all throughout the Gospels. And this is the standard that we need to live by. If you go to John 14, listen to this. Jesus says, John 14, verse 15, If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot re receive him because it's not looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. I will not abandon you as orphans. I have come to you. Soon the world will, will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. And when I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father and that you are in me and I am in you. And those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each and every single one of them. If you love Jesus and if you are a Christian, you are to obey his commands. What does he say in the next chapter? The very next chapter, he says this in verse 10. John 15, 10, when, not if, not that you might, not that it's difficult. This is a command. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. We are to obey and follow the commands given by Christ. And in today's society, everybody goes, you know, but God knows my heart. God is all loving. God knows my past sins, my present sins, and my future sins. He knows what's best for me. And it all sounds nice. It all sounds honky-dory. But Jesus gives us this very stern warning in Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus tells his disciples that not everyone who calls out to him, who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of his Father in heaven. Those are the ones that's going to enter into all eternity. And then Jesus said, on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, depart from me, for I never knew you. Now get away from me, you who break God's laws. And this has to be the scariest verse in the Bible because Jesus is showing it doesn't matter what you think that you produce. It doesn't matter that you th what you think you accomplish here on this earth. It doesn't matter if I used you to perform many signs, many wonders, and many miracles here on this earth. You must live and obey what is written down in God's word. So what does the Bible say about a gay lifestyle? Well, let's go to Romans chapter 1. So Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 32 and it says, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful and wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse 
for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even giving him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. And this is the problem that's in today's society. We live by our own understanding of life. We live by our own moral compass, our own ideas, what we want to do now, what's going to satisfy and gratify the flesh that we completely neglect the things of heaven, that we completely neglect the standard that God's called us to live. God called us to live a standard. And the Bible is not just a book of rules. The Bible tells us how to live a life that's pleasing for him. The Bible is our manual, like, like how we have an iPhone. The manual tells you its use. The manual tells you how far you can push the iPhone. It tells you how much memory you have. It tells you the, the lifespan, the best way that you can use that iPhone. That's the Bible. The Bible tells us how we're going to live on this earth. The Bible tells us and speaks to us of our identity. The Bible tells us the best possible way to live. And anything outside of that is called sin. And sin is direct unwillingness to obey God's instructions. In verse 22, it says, Claiming to be wise, they became utter fools instead. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worship idols to make it look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever their shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God and worshiped a lie. So they worship and serve the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural ways of having sex and indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned for lust with each other. Men did shameful things with other men. As a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty that they deserved. And since they thought it was foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should have never been done. God will leave people in their sin once they made up their mind that, you know what, I, I don't care, I'm not going back from this. And you could see whole societies that God just completely left just to indulge on their sins. One of those examples is Sodom and Gomorrah, a place that the Bible describes was full of wickedness. They were in, indulging in homosexuality, men with men, women with women, and the Bible says that it was a stench that displeased God. And then verse 29 says, Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness and sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deceptions, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they even disobey their parents. They refuse to understand. They break their promises. They are heartless and they have no mercy. And this is act actively depicting today's society. People that disregard the life of others. People that don't care about having genuine human connection. It's all about what I can get, what I could do. And maybe you're living or you're noticing this around while I'm, re while I'm reading through Scripture because this is very applicable in 2024 about what is going on in today's society. And with all the money at man's disposal, they cannot solve the problem, which is spiritual. They will never be able to solve the sin problem. There is only one solution for the nations of this world, one solution for society, and that solution is the person of Jesus Christ. And if you've never made up your mind to follow him, maybe you once did, but things got wayward a death of a loved one, a crash in business. You just maybe got caught up with the things of life that had completely turned away from the faith. I'm going to give you an opportunity to settle your accounts before God and come back to Him. And this is going to be a big pill to swallow, but it needs to be said. The Bible is full of examples of what is detestable to God. And one of those things is this kind of lifestyle. I'm going to give you one more verse before I close up and pray for you. It's taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. And it says, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not enter the kingdom of God? 
Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, or worship idols, or commit adultery, or male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or are greedy people, or are drunkards, abusive, or cheap people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. God is very specific. God is very clear. And he has given his instruction all from Genesis to Revelation. It's not to rob you of pleasure. He created you with a purpose. He created you with a plan. He created you specifically. And there is an order to how we're supposed to live. And I want to pray for you. Maybe you've been living like this and you're like, you know what? I've been battling. I've been on the fence. Or I've never seen this in scripture before and I really want to pursue a relationship with God. I'm going to give you an opportunity to get right before God and to settle your accounts with Him. And when you do, you're going to have the greatest rest that you've ever known. Because there's nothing better than in being right standing before God. So pray the simple prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you today. I give you my life. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me. Cleanse me and make me new. I believe in my heart that you died, and on the third day you rose again. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and my Savior. I renounce to the world. I renounce to the devil. Heaven is my home. And from today, I am your child. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. And if you pray that simple prayer, I want you to reach out to me. Email us at contact at epicgospel.ca because we want to get some free things specifically to you. We have a couple devotionals. We have books about your identity in Christ, what you have been redeemed from. We're getting you that absolutely for free to help grow in your relationship with God. So welcome to the family. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and I'll see you in the next video.